let me introduce our guest speaker this evening. And where did I put that? So uh, we have Sean Rowe with us, and he is with the. Uh, can everybody? I don't know if you can. Um, <laughs> well, you'll see Sean soon enough here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to do a quick introduction. He has a, a PhD and is an appro uh, associate professor with the Oregon Sea Grant, Oregon State University College of Education. And, uh, and for nearly two decades, Dr. Rowe has been carrying out research and teaching related to the intersections of everyday knowing and thinking with the interdisciplinary science, uh, teaching of science, technology, engineering, and math, which is STEM, and has a background in applied linguistics and developmental psychology. His work is focused on family interactions and in informal learning environments and how exhibits and activities support or undermine learning. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. I don't think that uh, spoils any any of the details that you're gonna be talking about tonight. So I'll let you introduce what you're gonna be uh, talking about uh, tonight. So without further ado, why don't you take it away, Sean? Thanks for coming, glad to have you. Thank you very much, Trevor. And thank you all for having me here. I recognize some of the names popping up on the screen over here. Some folks I haven't seen in a while, so uh, I'm glad people are here. Um, <clears throat> Trevor, uh, Trevor kind of gave the official bio biography. Um, I am, I'm, a, I, I'm trained as somebody who's a linguist and I study how, how our thinking is shaped by how we speak and how in talking to other people, interacting with other people and interacting in learning in contexts that aren't school, like um, participating in a restoration project or attending a museum or looking at something on the internet or watching uh, nature television on, uh, with your family. These kinds of experiences shape our learning and shape our thinking about things like science and climate change. And that's what I study and that's what I've been saying for a long time now. Uh, it sounds bad when you say for almost two decades, but <laughs> it just makes me feel old. Uh, so I was when we talked about what you guys might be interested in hearing about, uh, we kind of settled on taking, we've done a lot of research at Hatfield with the Visitor Center. I, I know everybody here is familiar with the Visitor Center and the work of Sea Grant at Hatfield at the Green Science Center and what we do. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the Visitor Center, but I'm going to talk about the the kind of work we've done there since about 2004 and uh, some of just briefly overview what it looks like and some of the things we've learned and what we're doing now uh, in terms of that. <clears throat> but I really wanted to get to what it means for thinking about and talking about climate change with people, because that obviously is something that all of you do uh, or are interested in or are called upon to do whether you like it or not uh, at some point in your in your volunteering, in your work, in your everyday lives. Um, so as Trevor said, well, I'll, I'll talk um, and then we'll save the questions for the end unless there's just something absolutely burning that needs to be clarified about what I'm saying. Uh, and then if you just raise your hand or something, it's hard for me to see those things <clears throat> during the presentation, but uh, Trevor can, can give us a heads up or somebody else can, thanks. Uh, let me see if I can start advancing slides. Will they advance for me? Yes. <clears throat> so um, I came here in 2004, uh, and part of the reason I, I was hired by Oregon Sea Grant was to come in and say they had this great idea about what they call free choice learning, which is learning that happens outside of school time. And you, they wanted to, as the director then put it, advance the art and science of free choice learning using Hatfield. And so we set apart to do that. What we mean when we think about free choice learning is this, maybe it's more accurate to call it lifelong, life wide or life deep learning or all three of those, because it's all that time of your life, which is most of your life, uh, for everybody here, it's the bulk of your life at this point, is not spent in school. Uh, it's actually spent outside of any formal learning context but you don't stop learning in that context, in any of those contexts. In fact, you're constantly learning. You're constantly taking on new information. You're constantly dumping old information. You're reviewing what you know and what you don't know. You're modifying it. 
you're growing, you're changing, you're forgetting. And that's not a bad thing because if you didn't forget things, you, you wouldn't be able to remember new things. <laughs> we do have some storage capacity problems as uh, human beings. Um, <clears throat> so we're really interested in that 60 to 70, maybe even 80% of your life that is spent outside of school context where you are learning. And the, the real, why this is interesting is because nationwide, most of the research on education and on learning, especially even adult learning, is done in schools. It's done with K-12 audiences, it's done with undergraduates at universities, it's done with adults in work and training programs. And I call those captive audiences, right? It's like studying chimpanzees in captivity. You can learn a lot about how learning happens in captivity, but if you really wanna see it, you wanna study it in the wild. And this 70% of your life where your learning is basically cognition in the wild. So that's what we do. Um, in 2004, what we did was we took the visitor center at Hatfield and we said, you know, what would it mean to turn this into a research lab for studying this kind of learning? Uh, and so we re really reimagined the whole program that way. And we kind of started small. We got an award actually from the Confederated Tribes of Celeste to do some work on sea otter uh, population dynamics and restoration and public understanding and communication of that. Uh, and then spun that out over the years into uh, a, a series of larger and larger efforts, larger and larger pots of funding and publications, graduate student work. Um, it's been a pretty successful program, uh, all happening in a place that's primary mission is public education. And that's also quite different because usually university research is kind of carried off in university labs somewhere. Guess what? If we take you into a lab to do research, that's captive audience again. <laughs> so we really like going out and seeing people in a place like the visitor center where they can walk in, walk out, choose to do the research, choose to not do the research, um, choose how much time they're going to spend on things. Uh, and basically, we are unique in the nation in this regard, doing this kind of work. We started really basic. Uh, so when I make the connection to studying chimpanzees, it's kind of like that. You know, uh, you, you see videos of Jane Goodall sitting out in the field. She's hiding in the trees and she's got a clipboard. She's got a stopwatch and she's taking notes of what the monkeys are doing. Now use an iPad instead of a clipboard and a stopwatch. That's basically what we did for several years. Some of you recognize Bill Henshemaker in the top uh, picture up there, uh, tracking visitors, literally drawing on a map how they're moving around the visitor center or giving them handheld devices so we can ask them questions as they go around or interviewing them. Uh, this is one of my first graduate students, Alicia Christensen, uh, uh, interviewing Whale Watch Spoken Here volunteers and what people are learning from working with them at Yaquinta Head. So it really looked like this. We did very small studies with small numbers of people because you imagine tracking 100 people is pretty labor intensive and then interviewing them is really labor intensive. Uh, and so you get small pots of data with interesting findings. But in 2011, we got this big NSF grant, National Science Foundation grant, to basically wire up the visitor center for sight and sound. We installed a set of surveillance cameras, a set of microphones, and a face recognition system uh, so that we could really look at all the visitors who came to the museum, which is about 150,000 people a year at Hatfield, uh, and all their interactions at key exhibits, and really try to understand in a deeper way with this kind of large pieces of large sets of data, how they were learning, what they were learning, what the supports for learning were uh, in a museum context. And we did this for about seven years. And this is what, this is, what it looked like was building these kind of what we call research platforms. So we started taking exhibits or programs or even marine ed programs in some cases. And, and when we designed them saying, this isn't just about delivering content to visitors. It's not just about creating a, an exciting experience for visitors. It's also about creating a research site. So visitors are coming to work in a platform that's collecting data on how they use it. And some of those were physical platforms, some of them were, were digital platforms, like the one in the photo, and some of them were live animal platforms, like our touch tank exhibits. The, the camera system looked like this. There were about 40 cameras installed in the visitor center with microphones hidden away in exhibits and things like that. 
this kind of management system on the back end where I would walk into my office in the morning, turn on the, the computer and it looked like something from NCIS Hawaii or something because it'd be, you know, all these cameras kind of showing me different views of the visitor center and kind of alerting me to things going on. And then a whole bunch of servers and storage. At the height of the system, we were collecting 64 terabytes of data every 20 days on visitor use of the visitor center. This is literally what it looked like on my desktop for those seven years. Uh, so you, this is camera views all over the museum. They're running in real time. The thing on the right hand side is, uh, is where it's green. That means there's something moving in the camera's vision and where it's red, it means there's nothing happening. So you really zero in and find these events or find spaces or find times when things are happening at exhibits and capture data around particular interactions, particular conversations, or particular exhibit interactions and components. The, the long and short of that was it worked. We learned a lot actually in those uh, six years of research between 2011 and 2018. Um, we had eight new dissertations published, we had a bunch of publications that went out. We've still got publications coming out of the data that we collected that we still haven't analyzed uh, since the project stopped. Um, we are, we're basically slogging through data at an extremely slow rate, especially because in 2019, we took everything down for the renovation of the visitor center. Uh, and then uh, just as we were kind of cranking back up for the next thing, of course we closed everything because of the pandemic. Um, but, the, but we learned a lot. And one of the things we learned is that we didn't want to do that again, <laughs> for lack of a better way to say it. Um, and so in the, at the, toward the end of that process of running this whole giant research center in the museum, we decided that it would be a lot better if we could take this entire system, make it mobile and go out to the places where people are actually doing things outside of the museum. So that might be a charter fishing vessel, that might be a parking lot, people teaching each other how to skate in a parking lot or under a bridge learning how to surf. Uh, and we really wanted to be able to, to collect data really in the wild. And this is kind of what it looked like uh, on the left-hand side of the picture is a, a researcher from the Oregon State University STEM, research, STEM Learning Research Center. And she's got one of our um, setups for mobile use. You put it in these Pelican cases, you carry it out, you install it in a site where you wanna collect data, you collect data, you bring it back and analyze it from there. Um, <clears throat> that meant getting a whole new set of partners and all kinds of new research opportunities. So here's a, one of our uh, a text from our project installing the camera system in, at a maker fair over in Corvallis and those tables that are blocked off, that's what, that's what we do. We, we can block off certain sections in the video and when something enters that space, we can count it, we can record it, we can take data about it, turn on a microphone, turn on off a microphone, that kind of stuff. We also started working closely with uh, museums around the world, in particular uh, through a whole set of projects in South America, in Brazil and Argentina and Colombia, looking at similar kinds of learning contexts and how people were interacting there, uh, what people are thinking about science and learning about science in Bogota, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, in Taiwan now. Um, so really, trying to take what we learned in Hatfield and about Oregonians and people visiting the Oregon coast and put it in this larger global context of, uh, of how people think and learn. <clears throat> this kind of gets to the meat of it. It's interesting, you know, all this research, all these millions of dollars of research and person time and effort, thousands of hours of effort and literally tens of thousands of interactions I've watched on videos over the years. Um, We've learned that exhibits and experiences that, that really promote learning have some pretty common features, uh, these six features in particular. Uh, the more of these you have in a uh, communication experience about science or an exhibit about science or in a citizen science project uh, that has a learning component, the more people learn at the end of the day and will will uh, not just learn, but the more they want to learn at the end of the day. So the more motivated they feel to learn more, uh, which I think is really important. So one of those is encourage collaboration. Uh, that's probably not a surprise to anybody uh, here that collaborative learning contexts actually promote learning better than individualistic learning contexts. That's tricky though, because a lot of people 
don't like learning in groups. They like learning alone, uh, but that's a feature of schooling. So what happens is you, you get really good at learning in school and it's really a heads down uh, individual kind of learning activity. Um, but when you're learning on your own in everyday spaces or uh, using YouTube to learn how to do something, for instance, it, it works better when it's collaborative, even if you don't prefer collaboration. I think that's really the interesting piece about that. So creating those contexts where people are actually working together to solve problems, uh, or working on joint things that they have to pay attention to really promotes uh, learning and communication. Things that people can do at the same time, but do different things. So allowing multiple users to use and exhibit or, an ex or be part of an experience, but not all having to do the same thing at the same time in the same track, that's really important. Uh, exhibits and experiences that promote eye contact. And this is, Zoom's great, but uh, this is what's missing in Zoom. Um, literally, when people look at each other over a table, more learning happens than when they stand next to each other at the same table. Uh, and we've seen that over and over and over again in our research. It's absolutely amazing. I think because it encourages more collaboration. Um, multiple outcomes. So one of the problems we have in teaching and learning is that we have specific things we want you to learn. And if you don't learn it, we failed. Uh, but when you leave the school and go out into museums and everyday life, uh, people learn and they learn different things from experiences. And when the experience allows for that and encourages that, and then encourages people to talk about what they've learned and share it and not feel like what they learned wasn't valuable or that they didn't learn the right thing, uh, then they tend to learn more and they tend to want to follow up and learn more later. Um, and then these last two, I think, are really interesting for thinking about climate change in particular. Uh, when, when communication combines everyday language and thinking styles with more scientific language and thinking styles, more stuff happens. So sometimes we think about, you know, well, it's better to communicate science by just turning it into everyday language. You see a lot of this in um, TV shows for kids and things like that. So science is like cooking, cooking is like science. We'll just teach you how to cook, you'll learn science. Um, well, the language of cooking is important. The language of the thinking routines in cooking are similar to those of science, but they're not science. Um, when you can combine these two things in one experience where people are moving back and forth, it's almost like being bilingual. Uh, you can move back and forth from Russian to English or Spanish to uh, Portuguese in a conversation. Uh, it basically gives you more ways to think about the world. And when you can move fluidly between these more scientific ways of thinking and more everyday ways of thinking, it makes you a more fluid thinker and operator in the world. And this, I think, goes hand in hand a little bit with the, other, the last piece I want to talk about here, which is exhibits and learning experiences, contrary to what most people think, really are more effective when they elicit visitor values and worldviews. And we are so nervous about that kind of thing, especially here in the United States. Um, museums are very reluctant, for instance, to talk about religion or spirituality as a way of knowing about the world. And yet when you open the door for that and visitors feel like they can bring that to the table as their way of making sense out of the things and that it's, it's okay for them to use it as they try to negotiate their way into scientific ways of thinking, for instance, then they are more willing to engage and they learn more and they want to learn more later. Um, and this is, I think this has been the hardest one to convince other museums to try uh, and to really think about is um, how to, how to teach science and create opportunities for learning science that, that also allow for non-scientific ways of knowing or even anti-scientific ways of knowing. And it's a little bit of a tricky, uh, sticky wicket. I don't think we have solved that problem yet, but what we do know is this, when you open the door to talking about values and worldviews, people learn more, they engage more. Even people who don't like it. So that's what exhibits and experiences in a museum can do and how they promote kind of communication learning. What's the role of explainers and educators and docents in that, right? We talk about this, I should, I should have mentioned this, it's up here, I forgot to mention it. We talk about this as encouraging protagonism. So a protagonist is the hero of a story, right? And we're, we're really interested in this role of when you become your own protagonist in terms of your own learning, what happens. And these things that are in the, uh, in the slide here encourage this protagonism, taking agency over your own knowledge and your own learning. So what's the role of explainers and educators and docents in doing that? 
for the last two or three years, we've been doing research around the world, like I said, uh, looking at uh, exhibits and experiences guided by docents in Rio de Janeiro and in other places around Brazil, uh, looking at um, programs in places like the um, uh, Maloca, which is the big science center in Bogota, uh, with teenagers in particular, because teenagers are not often studied in learning research for, for a variety of reasons. Um, and what we've learned, from, or, and then also in places like uh, that give tours, historic houses, uh, historic places that do tours and are kind of place-based learning contexts. Um, and what we've learned from that is that when you have docents, when you have educators, when you have volunteers who are communicating and trying to teach, it really, their success depends on the strategies they employ, right? We've looked at about 25,000 interactions with our data at this point, where there are youth working with visitors, adults, I mean, adults working with explainers, youth working with explainers, youth working with youth, adults working with youth. And what you see is that there's this kind of difference between people who have a style that's very much a monologue and a style of communication that's based on dialogue. And monologue can be good. It's about delivering information accurately. It's about demonstrating what to do and how to do it. And it's about doing the exhibit in a particular way. And I say this is, it can be good because think about something like a lab science class in, in high school or chemistry class. If you don't ever learn how to do the work safely, you're going to blow up the lab. And so the best way to teach somebody safety in a lab is through these kind of monologic strategies. The best way to teach somebody about climate science and climate change is not these strategies. Um, in fact, these go down really poorly with people as soon as you leave the kind of the realm of, well, there's specific skills I need to know, or there's a specific process to follow and get into things like, oh, I'm supposed to think about the world in a particular way. Well, what if I don't like the way you think about it? Um, and so these dialogue strategies that people employ, either because they've been told to or because they just turn out to be good communicators, are really based on question and answer, that kind of Socratic method, uh, encouraging visitors to ask questions of them, of, 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 among each other or of exhibits or of phenomena, exploring open, ex encouraging people to explore things in open-ended ways. And people do have to be encouraged to do that because they're often nervous to do that in a new experience. Um, introducing scientific content as hypothesis or observations. So instead of saying to somebody, well, the, uh, you know, the water temperature is important because of this, uh, you can say, well, you know, it seems to me the water temperature might be important because of this kind of thing. What do you think? How can we test that? And then again, connecting to visitors' values. And, um, the and again, this one comes back to that notion that this can be a little tricky because often values is the, is the conversation we never want to go down with people um, because they might be different than ours. And that can be really tricky in today's world, as you know. Um, this may not be too surprising for any of you who are familiar with research on classroom teaching. They get similar, there's all similar kinds of findings around teaching and learning in classrooms as well around the world at this point too. Um, so what about parents? Parents are interesting because unlike explainers and docents, parents don't have any particular claim to knowledge except that they're parents. Um, so what's their role in communicating and teaching? Uh, this is a project that has to do with uh, understanding biodiversity in uh, uh, rainforest uh, uh, ecosystems and looking specifically at parent-child interactions as they move through an exhibit. Um, we do a lot of this here. We did a lot of this in the visitor center, but we're doing this also in, uh, in Brazil. Here's another one. This is, uh, this is actually an exhibit we built in Brazil based on the kinds of things we do at Hatfield uh, to look at um, oceans. Uh, and uh, what ocean science is like and biodiversity in the ocean. And we're using the data that has come from this exhibit to really look at the, the role of emotion in learning because it turns out that when you have parents and children learning together, very often those parents spend the bulk of their time managing the emotional experience of the children um, and managing children's emotions and teaching children to manage their emotions. Um, and emotions are a huge part of learning that we have largely ignored until the last 10 years in psychology and in educational research. And so we're really trying to crack that nut a little bit. And again, it gets to the same things. It's really, people don't have any problem when you're talking about what people learn, how knowledge is transmitted. So as you start talking about worldviews, values, and emotions, scientists get nervous, education researchers get nervous, teachers get nervous. 
visitors get nervous talking about their emotions. And so this becomes this kind of interesting place where research is a little more difficult. Uh, and But this, these techniques we've developed are helping with that because most of the data we collect is done in a kind of unobtrusive way. And we're not asking you to talk about your emotions, but we're looking at them and then talking with you about them after the fact, having debriefing them in a sense. Okay, what does this mean for communicating climate change? So really, in the last five years, my work has shifted largely to thinking, but largely because my students want to do it too, is really thinking about climate change as a major problem and the communication of climate change as a major problem in the US in particular, uh, but worldwide. And when we think about the kinds of things that Sea Grant cares about, resilient coastal communities, sustainable relationships to resources, um, these are obviously impacted by climate change and our thinking about climate change. Um, all the work you do in the Watershed Council is directly connected to climate change and mitigating climate change. The good news for all of you who have to talk about climate change, and want to talk about climate change in the U.S. now, is that Americans are more worried than ever about climate change, specifically about global warming. Uh, more Americans understand global warming than they ever have, and more Americans are falling into this kind of category of worried or somewhat worried about it. When I started, when we started doing this kind of research at Hatfield in 2011, uh, if you look on this graph, you can see that in 2010, 2011, basically less than 50% of Americans nationwide said they were worried about climate change. In our research at that point, we found that 77% of Oregonians were worried about climate change or somewhat worried about climate change. So Oregon was way ahead of the curve in this regard. The rest of the US is pretty much caught up with us now. Uh, depending on which um, uh, sources you look at, uh, people in the US are between 70 and 75% of people are report being somewhat worried or very worried about the impacts of global warming on themselves and their children and their communities. Uh, in particular. And this is really high. This is higher than in a lot of other places, uh, but it's lower than um, the kind of worldwide average still. But I think the news is we tend to, we tend to hear in the news that Americans don't know, Americans don't care. Uh, but even if they don't know much and they don't care much, they're, they're actually worried about it. How do you address that? Well, what we've learned, some of the things we've learned additional things we've learned from our research at Hatfield is that publics, publics want data. They want to see data when you're talking about science or when you're talking about things like climate change, sorry. Um, they really want to see data. But the problem is they hate being talked down to. And so much of the data that climate scientists use is so obtuse and so difficult for public, for anybody to get their head around who doesn't have a lot of experience looking at models, looking at complicated charts and graphs, looking at large data sets, or even understanding the, the affordances and constraints, but you know, how a data set gets built and, and what data goes into it and what data is missing and what you do when there's data missing. Um, the good news, I think what we found is that non-experts can be taught to interact with data more like experts through the kinds of experiences that are open-ended, multi-user, um, interactive, and based on kind of communication and dialogue. Um, they really can. And I, I think the good part about that is science has data and scientists like to share data. But there needs to be some work to, it's not really translate the data so much as make the data accessible in particular ways. Visitors are also not afraid to talk about complex and controversial science. So we've been surprised over and over again by how much visitors know about climate change, about conservation, about um, all kinds of what we think of potentially th think of as complex ecosystem level or systems level thinking about science um, and how they're willing to actually engage in the conversations about it. Visitors are willing to, in, at Hatfield, we have absolutely zero information about conservation, right? The aquarium has a lot. That, that's their mission. Uh, at Hatfield, we just don't have it. And part of that's been because historically there was a a feeling that we needed to shy away from that because it had too much advocacy built in. But our visitors are coming in and talking about conservation 
at our touch tanks, at our octopus tank, at our fisheries exhibits, they are having conversations about conservation. And this is an example of kinds of things they're talking about with their kids and that their kids are talking about with them and we are not part of the conversation. So being willing to step into conversations with families and with friends and with neighbors and other people about complex social issues and complex science really does make a difference because they're ready and willing to do it. And they're worried about it, right? This is not the image of the US that we're given on television for the most part, where we're all ignorant and don't wanna talk about science and don't believe in climate change. But in order to have these conversations with people, they have to be like real conversations. This is the other thing we've seen again and again and again in our research. You need to establish that you're a trustworthy, not authority, but a trustworthy conversation partner and storyteller. And that's where people like you come in because your friends, your neighbors, the, the school groups or the citizen science groups that you interact with at any given moment, they, they trust your authority in some ways, but what they really come to you for and what they really stay with you for is that they trust you as a conversational partner, as a storyteller and as a person. And, the, the, the typical vision of science is something that's kind of a, a objective and on a pedestal and scientists, people who are different than everybody else um, gets in the way of that. And so you, in this is actually current research we're doing with citizen science groups, with uh, adolescents in Brazil, uh, with youth in Taiwan and with youth in Oregon. We're really seeing that that before you even get to whether people believe in climate change or how much they know about climate change, if they don't trust the person who's talking about climate change as to be an authentic person talking about authentic things, then they just shut it off. You know, they've lost their trust in the brand of science, for instance, or of OSU or of research. This is, if you ask me, this is the major issue in the debate about vaccination right here. Uh, because a lot of people don't, it's not that they don't trust science, in fact, they do, but they don't trust the people who are coming to talk to them about vaccinations and science. Um, and this perception of trustworthiness really has three parts uh, that we're seeing every uh, throughout our research. The perception that you're being authentic to yourself, and this is so interesting to think about. This is not what we think about when we think about teaching and learning or science, that if I come off as being not, not a human being with my own history and values and point of view, then what I come across as is someone who's just the voice of an agency. And as soon as you come across as that, you've lost your footing. Uh, there's also this sense of integrity. People are judging your integrity as you speak. And this becomes super important. Does your message align with the values that you seem to be presenting in your authentic self? And if you're not presenting an authentic self, you're not going to get to the, to the, even the message yet. And then the third thing that I think what our work is really contributing to in the National Life conversation about this is this notion that visitors, because visitors want to see data, they also trust, the, they have a perception of the trust of the data if it's authentic. They want to know that the data is authentic and they want to know that the person who's talking to them about the data actually uses that data and not some other, it's not like a canned version or a watered down version. They want to know that this is the authentic stuff that you work with and that you know and that, that you can speak about in your work. And if you, if you can capture this sort of, this sort of being true to yourself, being integ having integrity about your communication and being true to your data, uh, then people really do, it establishes trust with people that you're talking to and that opens up the door for all this other conversations. Because of the national debates that are going on right now, I think this is an interesting thing just to point back out. 77% of Americans, this is a Pew Charitable Trust uh, survey that's been done about um, over the last 20 years. And so you can see these numbers go up and down, or maybe even longer than that. Uh, the 77% the of Americans say they have some or a lot of trust in scientists to do what's right for the public. That number goes down a little bit when you talk about environmental scientists, but it's still 70%. Only 35% of Americans say they have the same for elected officials. <laughs> so scientists turn out to actually be a good voice for thinking about things like climate change. And the, the cool thing about science and the, the enterprise of science for people in the United States is that when 
if, if you, by virtue of the fact that I worked at a science museum, everybody had trusted my authority as a scientist. So when my, when my office was the first office to the right after you left the visitor center, people would come constantly to my door bringing things they had found on the beach and ask me to identify them on the assumption that because I was associated with the Marine Science Center, I would be able to identify marine science uh, phenomena. Uh, well, I'm a linguist, I'm a psychologist, I couldn't do that, but they refused to believe that I couldn't do it. Uh, and so it became kind of incumbent on me to know who could do that for me at any given moment. That's the, that's the point. Even though I wasn't a field scientist working in this science because I was associated with the science, that same trust was extended to me. Um, when you're doing riparian restoration work, that same trust is extended to you because there's a general understanding that that's based on science, not politics. And I think we lose sight of that in the current kind of worldwide debate about science. And this is the last thing I'm, I'm going to mention. When you're communicating about your work, when you're communicating about climate change or science in general, it's not about the information. And that's we always fall down on that because scientists tend to revert to giving information accurately as being the most important thing. And in, in fact, in, your interpretation is more important than the information. And your interpretation is your aha. It's your revelation uh, that's based on the information that you that that you have authentically gathered, authentically understood, and are authentically communicating. Because interpretation is what gets people excited and interested, provoked uh, to want to do something and want to follow up and find out more. And if you can do that, you've really you're you're really a successful communicator. All right, I'm going to stop there. I probably went a little bit long, um, but I want to open it up for questions. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, so much. Yeah. That was I know it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot and a, a, real, a lot of really good and interesting information. So uh, a round of applause from everybody. I'll do that on their behalf. Um, <laughs> we don't have many questions thus far, so please uh, type your messages here into the chat box. Uh, or comments. Uh, if, if you have comments or ideas in addition to that, or things, hey, Kate, the things we should, uh, that we could be looking for or thinking about, uh, um, or if you want me to bring out the mobile cyber lab and put it on uh, a videotape, all of you out in the field doing work, I'd be more than happy to do that and talk about how did you learn to do what you do and how do you communicate it and teach it? Is it all waterproof? It's all waterproof. Yeah, it is. It's all, it's all based on GoPro cameras now. We used to buy these really expensive things that they put on uh, ATM machines. So if you see that little camera on the ATM machine or on the exit at Safeway when you're leaving, we had 40 of those and they were they, they were expensive and they did all these fancy things. Now we use GoPros because GoPros are cheap and they do all the fancy things. <laughs> That's, yeah. But they're all in waterproof cases because we do research in Oregon. In Oregon, yeah, I was just thinking that <laughs> makes sense. Um, okay, well, let me ask you this from uh, Cindy. She was yeah, hey, Cindy. says, have you done a survey for age brackets about worried climate change, especially K through 14. So I think she's referring to those statistics you use for how many people have kind of uh, come around to being worried about climate change. What yeah, that's an excellent question, Cindy. And there's a, there's a small amount of data nationally about that. The problem is that the big national polls uh, don't do research with anybody under 18. Um, and so uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, so there's a there's a sort of small. In fact, we're writing a grant right now around uh, uh, teaching and climate change curriculum, and um, and what we've seen in that literature. We haven't done this research ourselves, so this is just what I know from reading about it. Things that are getting published right now is that <clears throat> there's among youth generally. So the youth is kind of age six to sixteen. Uh, for this kind of thing, there's they rank higher than the national average in terms of their worry about climate change, but they don't really know much. And <clears throat> that worry turns quickly into fear, especially for younger kids. And then that fear shuts down their want to know more about it. And so we're really trying to understand that now. And there's some good new tools for doing surveys with kids about their sense of efficacy related to climate and to politics. Uh, and really understanding at what age level kids cue into environmental concerns and climate change in particular in a way that gives them protagonism and agency rather than fear and trembling, uh, which is what happens. 
to a lot of kids, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I remember yeah, so uh, so uh, uh, keep looking. Uh, uh, if you guys get me back here in a year and a half, maybe we'll know something more about uh, how third to twelfth graders actually fall down in Oregon around this. Well, this uh, this follow up question is kind of related from from her. She says, "How do we bring youth and adult together uh, for the climate crisis, working together in collaboration?" Yeah, so that, those six features of a successful exhibit that I put up, uh, those, they don't have to be an exhibit. It's, it's really six features of any joint activity. So, and the key is joint activity. So you got to find an activity where you can get adults and youth working together toward a shared goal, but with multiple different kinds of outcomes that they can each buy into, and they can be working toward the same goal, even if they're not working toward the same outcome. And that's a little tricky, but um, I'll give you an example from my work before I came here in St. Louis. Uh, and so there's these kids and adults in an exhibit, and the exhibit has these wheels you roll and you adjust these weights on the wheels. And it's, a, it's a supposed, supposed to be an exhibit about um, uh, rotary inertia and blah, 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 blah. And, but the kids are racing, and they're just playing around with these wheels to see who can win the race. And they're having a huge fun and they're spending an awful lot of time at it. And then the parents walk up and they look at it. They look at the sign. They look at the kids. They look at the sign. And they literally, the dad literally says, what are you supposed to be doing here? Right. And the kids say, I don't know, racing. And he reads the sign and he comes back and says, no, you're supposed to be controlling variables and observing the results. And so they dutifully comply, but only after he touches one of the wheels with them. And then now they're all doing this dutifully observing, you know, manipulating the variables in a consistent way and observing the results. And they do all that and they do it for about 15 minutes. And then the dad turns on and leaves and the kids go right back to racing, right? And they spend another five minutes racing the wheels. So it's this kind of joint activity where the adult can come in and the child can, or the youth can come in and they can each be working toward their own goals, but they can shift and work toward a shared goal at any given moment, but feel like they can go back to their own goals, see each other, make eye contact, um, uh, 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 come in and out as they will. Those kinds of experiences are the ones that create shared joint attention and shared joint goal setting. And if you really want youth and parents working together on climate change, you got to have experiences like that. Solve and clean up experiences at the beach can absolutely do those kinds of things. Right, parent area work should be able to do that kind of stuff too, for instance. Yeah, yeah, we the kids probably uh, do a better job at, at kind of bridging the, the age gap at some of these uh, volunteer opportunities that we have. So that's that's good uh, info. Um, uh, so next question was, uh, Margo says, fascinating. Can you give some examples of memorable aha moments you observed at Hatfield and what those moments seem to inspire? Um. One of my favorite that I see consistently uh, over and over again is when, when somebody has that moment where they realize that a sea urchin is an animal that responds to you. Uh, and so a lot of people think urchins and anemones, by the way, are plants. And as soon as, you know, you touch a plant, nothing happens, right? You brush plants out of your way all the time. So people reach into the water in the touch tank there to touch something and they brush against that uh, urchin or that anemone and it moves, right? Or it grabs <laughs> and they have this sudden realization that you can, and you can see it in their body language. You can see it in their facial expression. You can hear it in the exclamations they make. Um, they've just realized that this thing that they thought was inanimate is animate uh, and that leaves it all that just opens the door right there well does it feel does it eat does it sleep does it move and and then as soon as you tell them yeah the anemone can move it can actually move around the tank by itself then you know it's, now, now the, the whole world has changed for these people um, so that's obvious that's that's one that i see consistently over and over again um, another is uh um we have that this uh touch this table that's sand it's the coolest exhibit we've that i've ever been involved with building and you, you build up the sand and then it has an xbox a repurposed xbox that projects a topographic map on top of the sand and so as you move the sand it changes the map 
And then it displays the map in two, uh, in two dimensions on the wall. And everybody loves this thing. They spend lots of time playing with it. But then there's that moment, that sudden moment where they realize that what's happening on the wall, they're changing it. They're making it happen. Uh, and that is also this kind of aha. And then they, the whole action changes. They, they go from doing whatever it was they were doing to building with a purpose and doing things with a purpose um, to try to make certain things happen on that screen. So those kinds of things, I just, and then there's other ones like don't leave a ladder laying halfway underneath an exhibit because children are going to climb on it. Children are going to climb on anything. Uh, that's my aha. <laughs> if you put water in it, someone's going to fall in it, no matter how high it is, no matter how low it is, no matter how protected it is. Some parent is going to let their child walk on the edge of anything that you put up that has an edge on it. Those are my ahas. <laughs> well, I, I can't help uh, empathizing with the, the point about kids climbing on things because I have a like a 15-month-old little boy and he is climbing on everything he can. So uh, I, I can verify that point. Uh, <laughs> so jumping to trying to get other people's uh, questions in here, we have one from Jacqueline. She asks, um, how can this information translate into people's willingness to change behaviors? that influence global warming. So that same Pew study, or I mean, I'm sorry, the same uh, study I showed about, um, it's called the uh, Global Warming Six Americas. It's a, it's, the, it's a survey that's been done and, uh, multiple times a year since 2008. So tracking American perception of climate change, knowledge of climate change, willingness to act is actually something they ask about. And, uh, and that number is nowhere near as high. So today, in March of this year, 77% of Americans are more or less worried about climate change. Um, in that number, about 70, about 70 percent of them are worried because they understand climate change is going to have an impact on them or their children, right? visible change in their lifetimes. It gets down to about 60 percent, 59 percent of people are willing to change behavior to mitigate climate change. And I think there's two reasons for that drop. One of them is, you know, I talk to climate change scientists all the time and they're concerned about that too. And they want to do the right things. And so they're recycling and they're buying an electric car and they're doing what they can, but even they don't think it matters, right? They really have a hard time understanding that my, what I do is going to make a difference. It's just like voting. A lot of us have that, you know, I'm going to vote and it's not going to make a difference. I'm going to do everything that I need to do to mitigate climate change, and it's not going to make a difference. And I think part of the part of what we need to do as people who care about it and think about it and communicate about it is really try to unpack the gap between, you know, a scientist's global view of a system and the individual standing within that system and what they can see and do at any given moment, and really tell the story of how your use of a reusable bottle or bag or clothes made from recycled materials can actually, what the ripple effects of that are. Realistically, not telling a story about how that's going to save polar bears because it's not, but you know, what are the realistic impacts of that? And then how do those build up over time? And that requires an understanding of systems thinking and it requires an understanding of storytelling that's pretty sophisticated. Uh, but I think that's really important to make that to make that connection and, and tell that story. Rachel Carson did it, right? Scientist, fantastic, nerdy scientist, fantastic writer. She got DDT banned, right, because of its environmental impact. And so it can be done. Things like that, large scale social change can come from this kind of individual motivation to mitigate something like climate change. But we don't do a good job yet of telling the stories in a realistic way of how it's going to make a difference. Yeah, and it makes me think of what you were saying about kind of being a trusted communicator and those steps to become, uh, you know, have the, the good yeah. interpretation, but also build the trust with who you're delivering that message to, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I mean, at some point you overstep your trust as soon as you get out of the, and that's going to make a difference, you know, 10 years from now, that's going to make a difference. Well, how do you know? Well, I don't really know, right? And being honest about that, I don't really know. But here's how I put the story together so that I can see toward that and being honest about it. Great. Well, um, 
And there's uh, one, one other question I really want to I want, I want to try to answer because it's, Cindy has this question about art for expression of emotions. You're absolutely right. So we uh, so we have this new project. We're working with folks from Western Oregon, a dance instructor and computer science people who are teaching coding through dance. And uh, they're teaching a lot of things through dance. And so we are now videotaping them and the kids who are doing that and trying to understand performing arts. And so there's been some work around kind of uh, um, uh, the visual mediums in art as, an ex as a way of expressing emotion, but uh, performing arts, both as a way of expressing emotion, but also as a way of experiencing emotionally laden uh, uh, content, right? So if you're trying to, if you have to get up and perform a dance as a crab, uh, in front of your friends and family in a way that interprets crabs. Uh, you learn a lot about crabs, not just because of the content and because of doing the dance, but it's a hugely emotionally charged performance for you because you want to get it right. It's risky, right? Any kind of performing art is. Um, and the people who do that and go through that, they seem to be learning more about crabs, more about uh, uh, science and wanting to know more and retaining that longer than people who see the performance. Right. So there's really something inherent in the doing of art that can be really powerful for understanding science. And I think it's because of the emotional risk that's involved with doing art that's not as clear in doing science. But that's something we're absolutely trying to delve into in a really deep way now uh, and understand in different ways. Very interesting. Um... Well, I think we're, we're right at 7.30, so that's a pretty, pretty perfect timing to maybe call it a, an evening and just say thanks again, Sean, so much for, for coming out and, uh, and giving this presentation. It was Certainly. Um, my email, I'll put it in the chat, too. I'm always very happy to, to field emails, to, ask, to answer questions um to, to send you uh, to other people who know a lot more than i do about bigger things i saw there was a question about working with lincoln county schools um i'd be love to talk with more about that uh kate goodwin would know a lot about that too who's in the room here so but please do let me know if you have any questions thank you all for having me really appreciate it great thanks sean